Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm really looking forward to the two talks today. So we've got uh, two of our ASAP Bio fellows, actually, from this year. We've got Lamis and Benet, and they're both going to talk about preprints and the global south, which is quite a big topic. Um, they're going to do it from different perspectives, though. So Lamis is based in Africa, and so she's going to give you a very much of a, an Africa-type perspective to this. And then Benet, who is based in India, is going to give you more of an India-based perspective. I've not done any upfront slides on this in terms of um, preprint rates from, from across the world. There's data already out there that I'm sure pretty much everyone on this call will have seen. Um, but it is very interesting that there's a, a very clear divide between the Global North and the Global South in terms of their attitudes to preprinting and actually preprinting the actions and activities of doing that. So whether it's preprinting or preprint peer review. Um, and just to put a little bit of context to this, India, I think, is currently the leading country in the Global South in terms of preprinting, um, depositing preprints. I don't know what that looks like for preprint peer review. Daniela might have a better idea of that. Peer review are great for sort of the, the review activities they do with engaging the Global South. Um, but with that, I will hand over to Lamis and we can get started. Hey, thank you very much, Johnny, and thank you, Asa Bio, for this opportunity to discuss uh, some of the challenges and the landscape of preprints uh, currently in Africa. Uh, so I'm Lemis al Khair. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Khartoum uh, in Sudan. I'm also the co-director and training lead of the Africa Reproducibility Network. Uh, so I cannot say that I have a ton of experience, but I think I'll talk more from my perspective and a perspective of an African researcher. Uh, so first of all, uh, I think most of you know that um, adoption of preprints in Africa is lagging behind. So we have this study that was done uh, by eLive that sort of looked at the preprints that are deposited uh, into bioarchive, uh, depending on the um, uh, country or nationality of the main authors of the of the preprint. And as you can see, it's a heat map. And as you can see in Africa, some countries are completely cold, are completely white. Uh, but there are some activity in some other countries. And of course, uh, as expected, the most activity is in uh, South Africa, uh, as South Africa is, is uh, geographically in the uh, South, but I think it could be easily considered uh, one of the global north uh, countries. So there is uh, there is uh, an issue with the adoption of preprints uh, in Africa. Uh, so as I said, so the adoption of, of preprints in Africa is growing, but it remains significantly lower compared to the uh, global perspective. And um, actually, me and uh, some of the uh, ASA Bio fellows of last year, uh, we did a sort of a survey that asked uh, 182 African scholars about uh, their perspectives around preprint. And we found that only less than 50%, 41.9% did actually post preprints uh, uh, by the time of that survey. So I think this well reflects the uh, the the notion that is known about preprinting in Africa. One other thing that uh, we did was that uh, this year, uh, uh, during the as part of the ASA Bio uh, programs, uh, we did sort of a, a, a webinar series that are aimed at raising uh, awareness of African researchers towards preprints, and. Um, uh, in the sort of the uh, registration form uh, uh, for these webinars, we asked uh, uh, African scholars some questions and we had 164 respondents. And of these 37% uh, have never even heard of preprint, had no prior knowledge of preprints. And, and I think I could relate to these because the first time that I heard the word preprint was during my eLife Community Ambassadors Program and even then, uh, I think people were talking at a level that was much higher than my, my understanding. I didn't know what a preprint is. So people were talking about, um, I don't know, increasing uh, 
policies and you know they were talking about things that I felt are far more advanced than my uh, level of knowledge at that time. And also 39% have never read the preprint and 67.8% have never authored the preprint. So all of these are, are evidence that there is an issue. There is definitely an issue around preprinting uh, in Africa. And actually during that same study uh, that we did uh, in the uh, last ASA Bio uh, Fellows Program, we found that uh, out of those 41% that did post preprints, these preprints were posted in, um, in, in the preprint servers that are either owned or operated by major publishers. So this meant, you know, that they are uh, probably posting uh, these preprints uh, when they are prompted to as they are going through the application uh, or the submission process uh, of their normal, um, uh, the normal traditional way. And actually, uh, uh, there is a, a post that PLOS gave and it, uh, it said that uh, they found that African countries dominated uh, the preprints opt-in uh, rates in, in the PLOS, uh, in the whole of the PLOS journals. And uh, this was really surprising, to be honest, uh, that uh, the, the eight of the 10 highest opt-in rates were from African countries. Uh, but this also ties in that, you know, it's because probably PLOS is one of the uh, uh, biggest uh, publishers that allow African researchers to uh, uh, publish their articles open access while waiving the fees. So it also, this could be an explanation of why uh, there is this high uh, opt-in rates. It's uh, because many, uh, many African researchers Usually their first choice for publishing is PLOS. Uh, uh, so maybe this is why there is higher rates uh, is observed by PLOS. By PLOS. Uh, also, uh, so what we could take out from all of this is that there is still dominance for the traditional publishing system in, in Africa. And they are sort of using, uh, try uh, participating in preprint posting uh, and an open science just as a co-option, not as a major practice that they're trying to do. One other thing is that preprints are being posted at the time of submission. And this of course uh, takes away from the great values that preprints could give uh, to authors if they were posted uh, prior to submission to a journal. So, there could be many reasons uh, about what causes this low adoption rate in Africa. And of course, the, the, the biggest reason is the lack of awareness uh, about preprints. And we can see that, like I can see that within my community. Uh, even I've been talking to prominent researchers and professors, and when I say preprint, they don't really know what it is, uh, or they might have heard of it, as they have encountered it, as they are uh, uh, submitting their uh, manuscripts to the normal publishing system, but they don't really know what it is. You know, it's for them, it's just an option that they click uh, while they are submitting their paper. So there is uh, a great lack in the awareness uh, of preprints and there are uh, many potential benefits and advantages, especially for uh, researchers based in Africa. Uh, of course, there is always concerns about scooping, and uh, for many parts of the world, this might not be, you know, a big issue. But for us in Africa, it is a big issue because, um, unfortunately, the system still relies on the traditional way of publishing. So, if a researcher posted a preprint, and then this preprint was sort of scooped and uh, someone else did the work quickly and posted it quickly uh, uh, or submitted it uh, quickly in, into a normal, normal journal and it got published, then this will diminish from the value of work uh, that the African researcher did. And it is a big issue, uh, unfortunately for us, because I said, uh, I can say the majority of our institutions don't really recognize preprints. Um, 
as I said, there is lack of recognition, not only by the academic institution and the funding institution, but even by the local publishers, uh, because there is a, a big chunk of publications uh, that actually are published uh, within local publishers within Africa, national publishers or institutional publishers. So all of these, uh, all of these uh, publishers, acad uh, academic institution and funding bodies, they don't really recognize preprints. And so uh, that's why probably African researchers don't care much about preprints. Uh, again, uh, there is a big cultural bias towards the traditional peer reviewed journal, and it's seen as more prestigious and more reliable. Unfortunately, we're still at the at that stage of you know seeking those Q1 journals and 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 looking for the highest impact factors, and this is the way that uh, most African institutions sort of rank uh, their academics and researcher. Um, there is also some skepticism uh, because, again, many uh, many people view preprints as not pe being peer reviewed. You know, this is one of the biggest uh, uh, um, issues that uh, Africans could find with preprints, and I think this is an issue that is uh, globally happening. That people are skeptical about the quality of preprints since they are not. Like they do not go through peer review first before they are posted. Um, and one other thing that could be more unique to Africa and the global north is the unreliable internet connection and the resources. It might not be uh, like, I think internet in most parts of the world is now just like air, you know, it's everywhere. For example, I came here to the UAE. I think you cannot function without internet and you have internet everywhere you go. But in Africa, that's not the case. Uh, for example, uh, the the days that I was in Sudan, especially after the war started, I couldn't even open my email, let alone uh, post a preprint uh, or uh, engage in a discussion around preprints. So this is a, a really big issue that I think most most folks in the uh, global north don't really see, uh, but it is a big issue for us in Africa. There is one other thing that I keep uh, getting while I uh, talk to more communities in Africa about preprints, and this is that this must be a conspiracy theory, and this is the new form of Western colonization. I've heard this so much now uh, that I'm really starting to think that maybe this is an area that while I'm advocating or we are advocating for open science in general and preprint specifically, we should put this in mind, you know, people have this uh, fear that, you know, maybe this is just the West trying to scoop our ideas, uh, trying to take our resources, trying to take our work and, 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 and you know, benefit from it. Uh, at first, I didn't pay attention to that, and I was just dismissing it. But since I've been uh, sort of uh, uh, going outside the RN community, and this is what we've lately been doing, RN, we've been going to communities, to local communities, and giving them talks about open science and discussing with them. And in each and every talk, there must be one or two people who raise this concern. So I think this is an issue that should be really uh, considered when uh, when uh, um, uh, trying to promote open science to the African community. So uh, there are efforts that are currently being made to enhance the adoption of uh, uh, preprints in Africa. So perhaps um, Africa Archive, the launch of Africa Archive, hopefully would you know uh, increase the adoption and and the use of preprints um, uh, among African researchers. And uh, there are also efforts by ESA Bio and Aren uh, that are aimed at increasing awareness uh, and, and conducting training about around preprints. And ESA Bio is doing that by its fellows program. Uh, I think, Johnny, if you could, I don't know the percentage of Africans that are currently in the ESA Bio program, fellows program, but this is, uh, you know, a, a good effort because I think if you could get uh, like one person in an institution convinced there is a high chance that this person will be the doorway 
uh, to that community and that person will be able to uh, convince that community uh, by the importance of preprints. So I think uh, even having one uh, fellow from Africa will definitely uh, eventually make a change. And the same thing at uh, Aren, uh, uh, we have launched a training program uh, that is uh, aimed at training local network leads. And it, uh, we did have extensive training uh, around preprints. And we thank Johnny for that. Uh, I think we had six or seven sessions uh, around preprints. And ASABI is also doing more efforts uh, that are uh, more channeled towards a wider audience in Africa. And this is mainly the uh, the project that is currently being uh, done by the this year ASA Bio Fellows, which is uh, mainly a webinar series that are mainly um, uh, hoping to address, uh, to deliver knowledge to African scholars, but also to address some of their concerns. And by that, I come to the end of my talk, and I hope I didn't take more time than I needed. Um, I think it's 17 out of 44 fellows this year are from Africa. From the top of my head, that might be slightly off. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over now to Bene. We've got a Q&A section at the end, um, although feel free to, to drop questions in the chat as well. Bene, I believe, has been preprinting longer than I've known what a preprint was, um, which I always find quite funny when we chat. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are, or good morning. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Asab Bio, and thank you, everybody, for being present. And I think what I'm going to do is to give you a little bit of an idea about where we are in preprints and uh, to tell you that preprints is a part of practicing open science and uh, what we have been doing or we ought to be doing, where we are and uh, where we're going next. And I think um, what I've done is that uh, Lamis did a great job in putting together some of the statistics on the Global South. And we are not going to be very different in India, although the numbers are very different and we are probably a few years ahead, but that doesn't mean that we are there. We have a lot of catching ups to do. My name is Binay Panda, and I'm a professor of genomics at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. This is one of India's uh, largest and the most prominent public universities. We are not very large in terms of number of students that we have, but uh, we are one of the largest public places in, in the country. And as Johnny said that I um, jumped into the fray when I saw the chance of uh, contributing towards uh, preprints and open science through ASA Bio, because uh, as I will tell you towards the end of this presentation, that my lab has been doing preprints for a very long time. In fact, uh, we are one of the first labs in India back in 2011, 12. And I think I believe our first preprint we sent in 2012 that got published in archive. That time there was no even bioarchive in 2013. So we have a pretty good experience of preprints and has been pushing preprints for a very long time. And I'm very happy, can't be happier to see that the global community, especially in the community in India, is finally trying to catching up and seeing the benefit of preprints. Okay. So this is a slide that I took, particularly the figure that the uh, on the right-hand side, the image I took from UNESCO. So you see that uh, on the top green part, which is essentially talking about open science knowledge and publications, and the data are only part of open science. So preprints that today I'm going to talk about, and we all are talking about in this uh, particular webinar, is only a part of open science. So when you are talking about publication, also keep in mind that a lot of people, particularly in the community that practice computational biology, bioinformatics, software, don't necessarily publish papers. They publish tools, they publish softwares, they publish um, mobile apps. So in those community, the open science is very much important as it pertains to data and the tools. So in the biology community, which most, I guess, today's audience are, uh, we used to scientific publications, articles, but the open science and the preprints also has a very far-reaching um, you know, applications outside of just the articles in the form of software applications, mobile applications, and data. 
So it goes without saying that preprints are open. You heard, already heard that from Lamis and uh, she did a great job in telling that they are open, they're accessible and they're freely available. And, uh, you know, initially I, I hadn't heard what uh, Lamis was talking about the, the uh, conspiracy theory and I, it's a good one. I'll, I'll actually quote her in, in my future talks. I hadn't uh, thought that people would think about that, but you never know. So most importantly, they also boost the visibility of the articles and the citation. So uh, towards the end, I will tell you some of the roadblocks that why people are not preprinting. And uh, also it establishes priority. In fact, once you have a preprint, this actually, I, I keep telling in the lab that preprints is a level playing field. In fact, particularly for people in the global South, particularly if you don't have access to a large sum of money, or for example, you are not in a very prominent university or research institute, you are not a big name, you don't have collaborators in the Ivy League or Oxford, Cambridge, all the big places, you have finally a place which makes a level playing field actually possible because you get a digital object identifier, as we know, it's a DOI, which basically tells this is your idea. So this is scoop proof and it makes it possible only through preprints. So exactly opposite to the popular perception that if I put the preprint out there, people are gonna steal. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Okay. What, and this is something important to talk about. What are preprint servers not? Or what preprints are not? Preprint server is not a place to dump unfair viable or shoddy job. In fact, preprint servers are exactly like as you'd send a finished manuscript to a peer review journal. So it should also not be perceived or seen an easy way out to publish your results. It's equally easy or difficult as you view or perceive your usual articles that you send for peer review journals. You preprint not because this is an easy way out, not because it just can easily be done, but because you truly believe in disseminating the results of science early, widely, and freely to all. And this is very important to say that you have to believe in this ethos. And once you believe in this ethos, it will come automatically to you that every single article from the lab, particularly those who are principal investigators, would actually send, or if you're a student or a postdoc or an early career scientist, you would be more encouraged to send preprints. So, you know, I thought I would show this. Uh, I like this slide because this, is this particular paper, which got published in Nature, and as you can see, it's a very important paper which talks about a specific variation in Africa and which is important for the HIV-1 load. Now, the one that I want to highlight here is the one that I have circled on the right-hand side. So if you see the difference or the time taken from the time that the article was actually submitted to Nature to when the article was finally accepted, we're talking about a five year gap. So I think it's pretty clear that if this particular article was not preprinted, the scientists involved in this work are actually withholding extremely important scientific information from the public and also from the peers for five years. Now, Many of us who are funded by public exchequer's money, I personally believe this is actually not, I mean, I know this sounds very strong word, but this probably is not the right thing to do because we are funded by public work. We have a responsibility to make sure that whenever our science is right to be disseminated, we disseminate it immediately. So this is the reason, one of the reasons why preprinting could be very important to reduce that gap to zero and make the results available immediately. Now, um, Lamis was talking about uh, the paper here. This is a paper which came out from Ekman and uh, Bradowski's lab in UC San Diego last year in PLUS One. And if you see the figure on the right-hand side by the color coding, uh, the yellowish the color, better it is for the percentage of papers which have been, or peer-reviewed papers which have been submitted as preprints. The darker the color, lesser the number of preprints that are submitted. Now, it is pretty clear from this figure that there is global inequality. 
although the global inequality is not same in everywhere in global south now you know this the term global south i must also tell you because uh, i'm sure none of you are in the field of international relations or geopolitics this is a this is a term which is not new but this is a term which has been overly used in the recent years and the global south is not a monolith there is a huge difference among countries in global south inequalities in those countries in terms of a lot of indicators as for the world health organizations indicators unesco indicators and also in science indicators so when we talk about global south we have to take also with a pinch of salt because global south is not a single entity there are multiple global souths within global south and the point here is this particular paper talks that you know took around 32000 sorry 33100 preprints from india compared that with 32000 in the us and of course many more so there is a inequality there is a disparity in numbers however very interestingly the paper also talks about the preprints from the low income countries and again the terminology for some of you may not be aware the low income countries the middle income countries or low and middle income countries or high income countries are definitions which are put together by the un based on the gdp per capita now as you can see here right now we have a tenfold variation in number between india and the us so india is probably number four and number five in the list in terms of the number of preprints submitted and compared to us which is number one so we have a lot of chance to improve situations on the ground in india now let's talk about specifics in the country where we are in terms of the preprint why people are not adapting to preprints and what can we do to improve the situation on the ground and what are we doing as a lab to improve the situation on the ground now uh, this is something that i prepared uh, for the talk that i normally give um, in the you know various seminars i go this is a very india specific slide the path to traditional journal publication particularly for experimental biology, which I assume that most of you in the audience today are, or were in your previous uh, life, you know that the path to publication in experimental biology is long. But in India, it's especially long. That's all you need to remember from this slide. We are talking about anywhere between five to 18 years it can take from the date you actually start writing the proposal, submit it to the funding body, to getting the publication. So you are talking about a lifespan of multiple students, PhD students, and multiple different people who actually can span through these 18 years. Therefore, it's very important as a lab, as an institution, as a nation, to make sure that the, the results of your work is available immediately as soon as you think it is ready to be disseminated. Okay. Now, there are two studies that were done in India. Uh, one is 2018 policy statement on the top left, which talked about, this is from the Indian National Science Academy or INSA. This is a policy statement which talks about dissemination of scientific results. And there is a paragraph which actually talks about preprint. I wanted to give you a historical preview of what people have been thinking in the country, what they have been doing. The one in the bottom is actually a survey, which the results were out in the research square last year. Although the survey talks about South Asia, but primarily the participants were from India. And essentially the survey talked about, there were about 70% of the people in the country. This to me uh, is a understatement. And as I'll tell you in a few slides later, that that number is way higher think that the preprints do not actually get the credit. And that's essentially the reason why people don't want to preprint. And many of the people actually think that preprints are a way where things can be scooped. As I told you in the beginning, it's exactly the opposite. Okay, so this is an interesting slide that I have taken from a talk which is given by Ludo Waltman. Many of you might know he's uh, one of the um, you know, like front runner in terms of pushing preprint. 
and he works in Leiden University in Holland, the Netherlands. And he gave a talk last year and the talk was arranged by the Indian National Young Academy of Sciences and I've taken the two slides from his talk. The paper he published on where the India data wasn't there, but in the talk he put India data. And what I'm showing essentially to you are nine different metrics. The metrics are written on the top, as you can see, what are the different metrics and it's color coded. And the re more reddish the color, the more prominent that particular feature is. And there are three different rows. Uh, the first one is physical science. The second one is life science. The third one is social science. I want you to just focus on the one that I have circled. As you can see that in the people in India see the benefit of preprint because they're free to post, establishes priority, can get feedback, and it's actually showing progress for the grants as well as free to read. Now, this is a very small sample size. I must admit that there's a lot about 125 respondents that this survey is based on, but nonetheless, gives an idea that what people on the ground are thinking. Now, similarly, this is also important and I'll allude to that in my later slides. Why do people don't preprint? I mean, it's such a great thing to do. Then you may ask that why people are not doing it? Well, they are not doing it primarily. Again, look at the circled numbers is because the journal is not integrated, the preprint to in. They are not getting a recognition of preprint. And in fact, this is one of the biggest one. In fact, some of you, um, uh, please be um, you know, aware that uh, we are planning to have a podcast, uh, as a bio -port podcast next month. I'm not sure when it is going to be posted. Johnny probably would be the best person to tell. But uh, we are planning to have a podcast to show in different geographies or talk to the experts in different geographies that how preprints have been, are being portrayed or taken into consideration during tenure and promotions. So here also, if you see that people think preprints are not considered in the recognition, particularly in, in grants and promotions and tenure, and therefore they're probably not preprinting a lot. Now, what are the reasons that on the ground people are not preprinting? Well, first and foremost is the old habits die hard. Many of you who are as old as I am, and I'm 51, so um, would know that as an experimental biologist, we are trained in a very peculiar fashion where we actually don't open up because we are very scared that people are going to steal our results. And I can tell you one thing, I worked in four geographies in the world for a very long time, in the UK, in the US, in Japan, now in India. And I can tell you, biologists, experimental biologists share the same DNA across. They don't share results early. They are scared somebody is going to scoop. And there are reasons for that. I'm not blaming them. But I'm just saying they are the same. They are scared of scoop. They are scared of results being stolen and not getting credit. And because, if you remember in the first slide, I told you that it takes a long time for experimental biologists to get to where they want to. So they are, they are petrified of sharing results. So this perception, if once you are a PhD student, a postdoc, it's just so deeply ingrained in your psyche that to change that and to put it in a preprint server where everybody can see before peer review, because peer review is considered to be the, the, you know, the sacrosanct of science publication. So it's very hard to change, however, that's not all. There are also some popular perceptions, which again go to the old habits. Preprints are not peer reviewed because people think peer reviewed means a stamp of approval. And I'll show you in the next slide, it isn't. Just because a article or a manuscript has been seen by two people doesn't really mean that you conquered. Even the reverse is true. Just because two people have given a negative review to the article doesn't mean the article is bad. It can go either way. And the second thing is that I'll give you an example of each of these. Anyone can post a preprint and there are outrageously bad half-fit ideas on the preprint server. And it's true to a certain extent, but it's true to peer-reviewed articles as well. You remember the uh, you know the the, the old science articles which was uh, cited by many people 
of the autism that got uh, grossly wrong. So peer reviewed articles can also be wrong. However, the perception that preprints has this more than the peer reviewed articles. The third is not supported by funding agencies and we'll talk about that also towards the end. This is a recent preprint came out in archive. In fact, I noticed it only a few weeks back and this shouldn't surprise you. Uh, just look at the number that I have circled. In fact, the largest number of retractions, and this is India specific data, okay? This numbers might be different in other geographies, but the trend are similar. The largest number of retractions are linked with fake peer review, which debunks the hypothesis or the people thought process that peer review is sacrosanct. Now, the second one, if you think that what the popular belief or the perception is, there are rubbish published as preprints. Well, there's some truth to it. And this is one specific one I want to actually point it out. This is a preprint uh, which was posted by one institution in Delhi, in fact, just right door to my institute, my university. And I believe this was posted in 2021 or 2022. Let me see. Okay, somewhere in 20, 2020. Okay. In the peak of COVID. Okay. Now, this particular preprint made a lot of headlines in the newspaper or social media because of the topic it talked about. There is a similarity between COVID virus and HIV-1. Now, you remember the hyperbole going on during that time about the origin of COVID. In fact, it's still an unsettled business. And if there's a paper like this which comes, the newspaper guys, the media actually jumps in. Now, it turns out that this is a very short piece of work, absolutely no rigor in analysis. And the investigators just jump to conclusion by doing one half-backed uh, you know, like uh, analysis on their on their sequences. And when the criticism started getting in, the preprint was withdrawn, but the damage was done. So the point I'm trying to make is when people think that the preprints can have half-baked ideas is not completely unfounded and we got to accept that. However, as I mentioned, the published articles, peer-reviewed articles also have the same policy. Now the third, this is again, I'm sure that every one of you have seen this data. This is a beautiful piece of data which was published in Infection Immunity, which is a journal from American um, you know, Society of Microbiology in back in 2011. And if you look at the graph on the right hand side, which is very clear, higher the journal impact factor, higher the correlation of that particular journals with retraction numbers, or in this case, the index, the retraction index. In fact, it is very important while I say this also to mention that although this correlation is very, very good, very striking, but it doesn't necessarily mean there is a causation. It's very important to point that out. However, the point, the reason I'm debunking all of this is journal impact factor is para, probably the single most parameter that stops scientists across the globe why they're scared of not preprinting and sending it to any journal that doesn't have an impact factor. As you know, eLife got you know, out of those impact factor business and rightly so, but this journal impact factor still looms large in the psych of scientists. And I think that's just rubbish because you know journal impact factor doesn't really talk about quality. Something which is published in Nature, not every paper in Nature is great, not every paper in PLOS1 is rubbish, right? So. It's, it's, you have to decide where your work goes based on the quality of the work and based on who you want the readership to be rather than the name of the journals and the journal impact factor as a surrogate. Now, the three pillars of open science in the country, and this is, as I mentioned, very India specific, what do they need to do? Funding agencies, host institutions, and finally, not the least, us the practicing scientists, the investigators. Now, the funding agency does not right now have an effective process or a communication that they can mention to that committee. So I um, you know, used to be co-chair of uh, the committee in one of the funding bodies. I still represent many committees related to genetics and genomics in the country. And there isn't any guideline 
that is given to us that how we should look at a person's uh, past work or preliminary work or a CV which has a bunch of preprints. Number one. Number two, the co-chairs and the chairs themselves are, tend to be old timers. And as I mentioned to you in the beginning that the old habit die hard, some of those experimental biologists who have been trained 50 years back, 40 years back, they absolutely have no idea about preprints. They think it's just, you know, it's not important. You have to have a paper out in a high impact factor journal. So unless the change starts from the people who are preaching this, it's very hard to do it. And that's the reason it has to start with people who are in senior positions. Although we know from experience, it's much easier to push it from bottoms up with the early career fellows. Host institutions also have a role to play, particularly the heads of the host institutions have to show the way that how preprints actually make a level playing field and it establishes priority, gives visibility, and also citable. Last but certainly not the least, the most important factor here are the fa factors which are us, the investigators. When we submit our work, we have to submit the quality of our work to the journal, if at all, but we must post all our articles to preprint servers to start with. We have to lead by examples. We have to show it in our lab that we believe in this. We believe in open science rather than talking about it. Once you start doing it, then I think you have certain weightage once you talk outside. So funding bodies, as I mentioned, have to include this preprint in the assessment process. Unless it's included, I think it's very little chance. Make it mandatory, like you know, from next year, 2025, Gates Foundation is going to make it mandatory. And I mentioned the chairs and co-chairs also have to practice this and start with the guideline and the policy. University, the research institutions also have a role to play, as I mentioned, encourage the researchers, particularly the early career fellows, to submit everything as preprints, develop policy and guidelines which are in addition to the national guidelines, not a replacement of the guidelines. And make sure you give credit or consider preprints in tenure and promotions. Because unless this is done, no early career fellow is going to post preprints. This is very important. Develop a dashboard so that you can show how many people have actually submitted preprints. Finally, faculties, discuss preprints in your journal clubs. Review preprints in your journal clubs. Post preprints all the articles as preprints. Now, you know, this is important, uh, last but not the least, preprints now, one of the criticism are not reviewed, it partially actually going to be addressed. This is an article which came out recently, a few months back in PLOS Biology, and uh, written by a bunch of people who represent funding bodies, uh, publishers, and variety of different organizations all around the world. And this is very important that we also should consider reviewing preprints so that this is in an important parameters of putting reviews out there openly so that people can read and understand. Uh, last couple of slides, I'm almost done. We as a lab have been, as I mentioned in the beginning, have been doing preprints for the last uh, you know, 12 years and starting with 12, uh, 2012, 2013, way before bioarchive. So we started with the archive, but then slowly for non-computational papers, we obviously put everything in, in bioarchive or med. I, we haven't, I don't think we have put anything in med archive because I don't think anything we think uh, fit it there, but we don't know about the future. So uh, we do that. Plus we have a open science policy in the lab. If you go to the website, I clearly mentioned that what we mean by open science policy, every single person who joins the lab is given that policy. Preprinting is non-negotiable. If you don't want to preprint then basically I have to politely decline the candidate. So this is non-negotiable. And I really believe that will actually help the students and scientists joining the lab. So what's next? I think uh, I would request all of you to post your own work in preprint servers, popularize preprints, talk about preprints and open science wherever you go in meetings, workshops, symposia. And uh, finally, you know, if you need anything from me, particularly if you're based in India or even outside, I'm available. That's my email. 
or we can do a virtual call. I am available for workshops and meeting. And next year, I am going to uh, speak at the Young Investigators Meeting, which is called YIM, mostly attended by the ECRs. And thanks to ASAP Bio, I would actually be um, you know, sponsored by them to go to attend this meeting. And this would be between 3rd and 7th of March, 2025. With that, I think that I might just last my emails and the lab ID. You are also feel free to be in touch and thank you very much. If you have any questions, we'd love to have those. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got 10 minutes for questions if anyone has any. Um, before we do questions, actually, maybe I, there's one thing I would like to add as a Global North perspective. As someone who's never been to India or Africa, um, we at ASA Bio started last year doing a, a lot of effort, effort directed at Global South countries, and you know we started primarily actually doing these closed workshops based in India, planning to do some uh, in Africa as well this year, and I've learned a huge amount that I think is very well is very much influencing sort of the decision making I'm taking and how I think about all these things, and as you're thinking of question, I'm going to open the whiteboard as well because this leads into that. Um, one of the things that I think is is drastically missing is the voice of people who are not based in the global north um because we sit on all these working groups and committees and we make all these decisions that affect everyone across the world without actually uh having everyone across the world represented so i think if there's one thing you all want to take away from that that, that would be the, the biggest suggestion i think we could all all make thank you everyone uh thank you to lamas and benet for your talks and I will see you all in October for our next Lunch and Learn. Uh, Katie's going to be, well, I'm going to be hosting it, but Katie's going to be doing all the talking. Um, and then we also have a Lunch and Learn in November with the Gates Foundation. That one, you won't see me at all because I'm away. So Katie is going to run that one. And we will be releasing our 2025 schedule relatively soon. It'll be in a few months. Um, we're still putting that together if you have any suggestions there'll be a poll open up when i close the zoom which if you fill out that's very helpful for me uh, and gives you an opportunity to drop in 